Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Bring your greetings from my wife. Just got off a plane yesterday, so she's a little bit jet lagged, so she's home. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul writes, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation. Sozo in Greek. Now, that's not just deliverance from your sin. That would be enough. But healing for your body, protection, provision. Every need that you'll ever have on this planet was paid for on the cross. Every need. Is that right? Every need. How many of you know long before God saw the crisis you're in at the foundation of the world? Is that right or not? He yeah. took care. He provided for that crisis before the foundation of the world. You know, it, it takes away all of that stressing and striving and pushing and shoving and do it, you know, trying to make it happen ourselves. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the gospel of Christ. You know, it's amazing, but I wonder, I wonder sometimes if we even know what the gospel is anymore. You know, we think anything that's preached from the Bible is the gospel. No, it's not. Maybe the Bible is not the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The good news that Jesus Christ paid the price once and for all. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. It's called unconditional love. Get a revelation of un here un The only two people that love you unconditionally is God and your dog. <laughs> Everything else is conditional. And, we, and we, we, we judge God the same way. We, we think that God's love is proportional to our, our performance. Based on our performance, if we fast more and we pray more and we, uh, whatever it is, and we tithe more, you know, God's going to... No, there's nothing. I'm not saying don't do that, but it doesn't impress God at all. He paid the price and once and for all. You know, Jesus came to preach the good news. Not that you're all rotten mongrels, is that right? But the good news. Is that right or not? The good news. Anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm. The birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest event in mankind's history. Now, you may know something about the Bible and Jewish feasts and blowing the shofar and a few other fella love's going to come now. But if you don't understand the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you miss the very centerpiece of the entire Word of God. It, 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 it astounds me that we place so little, really, on preaching the gospel. I, I'm not being smart. We come up with all these brilliant... And I'm not saying they're not wonderful and they bless people. But, it, you know, it astounds me that we place so really little importance on the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. Sin shall no longer have mastery over you. Is that right or not? Think about that. Romans chapter 6 with me quickly. Romans chapter 6 and here in uh, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. How come? How, co how come Paul wrote that thousands of years ago? How come we've missed it so much? Revelation, there's the Old Testament, there's the New Testament. Can I have an amen or what? Yeah. Now, I travel a lot. I, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. But you know, I find most churches have one foot in the Old Covenant, one in the New, and we just vacillate between the two. You can't mix it. Hello? You can't mis mix law and grace. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. For a new wine in a new wineskin has to be pliable. It has to be flexible. Old wine skins are hard, cracked. Is that right or not? And if you put the new wine in, you lose both. That's what the scripture says. You lose both. You know, so if you're still struggling with sin or sin consciousness, maybe you're still under the law. You know, for a long time, and we were just talking about E.W. Kenyon. You go back to Kenyon and realize again, he talks about sin conscious. The church is more sin conscious than righteous consciousness. Is that right or not? Anyway. So if you're still struggling with anger and fear and lust and pornography, maybe, maybe, maybe you've just not received the revelation of grace. Mm. I'm not being smart. Anybody can preach a message, not even have a revelation of that message. Mm. You can preach a revelation of grace, never even have a revelation of grace. You can preach grace without even the spirit of grace. Mm. It's not a message, it's a person. Yeah, uh, somebody just recently, I was with a young Aboriginal pastor that I'm mentoring, we get off the plane, I'm going to do a meeting. <laughs> and he says, before we go anywhere, Collie, I've got to tell you, I've got a problem with that message of grace. I said, well, it's not a message, it's a person. Yeah. It's really just bringing Jesus back. As the, is that right or not? It's the focal point of the church. Right. The law was given through Moses, but right. grace and truth came. Big difference between giving and coming. 
Is that right or not? I didn't have to come over, could have sent a DVD and you could have played it, but I came instead. <laughs> didn't send, came. Grace and truth. Isn't it amazing grace is tied up, is that right, with truth? Not the law is not tied up. It doesn't say that the law and truth came, it said grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What is it about truth that we actually have such a problem with? Anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm on that point as well. But grace and truth. You know, I don't know about you, but maybe, just maybe you've not had that revelation of grace. I, I'm not being a smart aleck. You know, I remember when I first got saved, I, the, the man that led us to the Lord had a revelation of grace from day one. He taught us about the father heart, fatherhood of God. Never in my life have I ever believed God made you sick. I heard great preachers get up and talk. And I never believed that in my life, no matter what they preach, because of the foundational truth. I've never believed in my life God put you through testing and trying. I didn't say you don't go through it. I said, I never believed God put you through it. No matter what I heard, because it was a foundational truth. Just the grace of God, that's not the God that I serve. But somewhere along the line when you're out there and religion, is that right? And the law constantly being preached, is that right? And you've got to do, you've got to do, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Eventually it starts to water down and all of a sudden you move away from a revelation of grace. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you. Interesting, bewitched, witchcraft. Anyway, I was just thinking, thank you, and I was just thinking about this. This is just me. I'm not talking about anybody else. But the strength of, of sin is the law. Nobody could keep the law. Can I have an amen? Yet we, yet we have seminars on preaching the Ten Commandments. I'm not being smart. Nobody, is that right or not, could keep the law. If, as Pastor said, if you break one, you're guilty of it all. So you've got to make up your mind. How many of you know? You know, I just come to the revelation, no matter how smart I am, no matter how talented I am, I can't make it in life on my own. I just need the grace of God. No matter how smart you are, no matter how talented you are, I don't give a rip. You don't have what it takes to make it in life without that grace. Can I have an amen or what? God's unmerited favour undeserved favor so if you deserve it it's no longer grace That's right. it's works it's wages That's right. can i have an amen or not yeah. but how many you got to love god more well he's not talking about your love for god it's talking about god's love for you yes. perfect love cast out all fear the only perfect love is god's love for us right. how can we have perfect love for god is that right he's talking about his love revelation of how much god loves you right. can i have an amen, amen. And so uh, this young pastor, we're driving, he says, I've got a real problem with that message of grace. And I said, look, I said, I'm not going to try and ram it down your neck. Remember the early days of faith, you'll remember. We had three tapes on faith. We were obnoxious. Is that right? <laughs> Dear God, if you're not in your faith, I don't want you breathing my oxygen. What's the matter with you? Talk about putting people under condemnation and guilt. Dear God, I go back and think, Did I, was I really that bad? God says, yes, you were. Yes, you were. Is that right? Just burn. Is that right or not? You know, and people thought we were obnoxious. Is that right or not? <laughs> anyway, I'll never forget, I had this Baptist pastor come to preach in my church in Darwin. And I, he got up and I thought, now what would this bloke know about the Word of God? I mean, hello. <laughs> I can't believe how obnoxious. I'm sitting there thinking this bloke wouldn't even know if his behind was on fire unless he smelt the smoke. <laughs> and the Spirit of God just spoke to me and said, yeah, that's a nice attitude of love. He preached the message on love. There wouldn't have been a dry eye in my church. He may not have taught faith, but he knew how to live it. Amen. We were lifelong friends after that. You know, praise God, even though I was an idiot. Hello. <laughs> God in his grace. Anyway, thank you for him. But you know, anyway, you just come to that revelation. Oh, the grace of God, the goodness of God. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. You know, it's sad sometimes. You know, it's funny because I've got to watch what I say, but... Pastor will know who I'm talking about anyway. We're on the board of a church back in Australia, you know, and the pastor's having it on with about three different ladies at the same time. And he's preaching grace. It's okay, you know. And it's so, when we found out, it so turned us off. You know, I just really got turned off to grace. And I'll never forget, you know, it just, my wife said, I can't even go to this church anymore. I don't want anything to do here. Well, let's get out. And so years later, like uh, we've known Pastor Joseph Prince for 25 years. I've been 
going up there since he had 100 people. So we know them quite well. And we're sitting down having lunch and he just had started to preach grace. And Jan says, oh, Joseph, we're really worried about you preaching that wishy-washy grace. <laughs> I reminded her the other day, aren't you glad he didn't take any notice of you? <laughs> and he said, well, pray for me, Sister Jan. He says, and maybe I'll keep, I'll keep it together. But she said, you know, that sloppy grace, that's that sloppy. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, you just because somebody gets a, is that right, goes off into a wrong area, doesn't detract from the word of God. Can I have an amen or what? It doesn't make the word of God null and void anyway. If you go to John chapter 1, verse 16, it's talking about grace and truth. The more that I read this and, 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 and spend some time and it's amazing. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 16. And of his fullness, we've all received in grace for grace. I love that. Grace, favor upon favor. Is that awesome or what? How many of you could handle that? Unmerited favor on unmerited favor. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth. Notice the combination, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. Old Testament, New Testament. You know, here's a revelation, you know. And I remember from early days of faith, we were taught, when you read the Word of God, first of all, ask yourself, who is it written to? Old Covenant, New Covenant. Half of the things are written don't even apply to us anymore. And we're trying to pull out Old Testament scriptures to bring in some sort of put people under guilt. Is that right or not? You know, condemnation. Who's it written to? To the Jews, to the church. Who's it written to? As I ask yourself, what dispensation? Old covenant, new covenant. Hello, can I have an amen or what? You know, how many of you know the law is you must do this to get favor. If you must, if you don't, you get judgment. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. But grace. How many of you know law is conditional? But grace is unconditional, Amen. unmerited favor, unearned. Re think about that, unearned. Un Get your head around that, unmerited. People say, I want what I deserve. I don't. <laughs> Trust me, I do not. I do not want what I deserve. Thank you, Jesus, for mercy, for grace. I do not want what I deserve. Now, you may be you do, but the background, I, I don't want that unmerited, undeserved. I love that. You know, think about God's ability, grace, God's ability to do something for you what you can't do for yourself. Right. Think about it. Is that right or not? Law, you've got to do something for God. Grace is, you know, God doing something for you. Uh, what do you want to live under? You know, I can't understand people that want to go back and live under the law. You know, under that. Anyway, Romans 6.14, did we go there? Let's look at it again. Romans 6.14. And he says here, for sin, sin shall not have dominion over you, but for you are not under law. That's pretty straightforward. For you're not under law, but under grace. Is that right or not? You know, we think, as I said before there, I really believe anyway, God's love is proportional to our performance. The more we perform, pray more, fast more. And I'm not saying don't do that, but what's the reason why you do it? You know, you can easily get caught up in works. I remember when I first started pastoring, I used to get up every morning. I'd pray three, four hours in tongues every day, every day as a pastor. Not because God told me, because Benny Hinn did it. <laughs> and I thought, Benny Hinn did it. He got those results. God's no respect of persons. He have to do the same for me. And I, I never forget the Spirit of God speaking to me. He says, when are you going to wake up? He says, it doesn't impress me at all. I love you. I even like you. <laughs> know all about you and still like you. Can I have an amen? amen. It, Revelation, when you confess your sin, it's not when God found out about it. <laughs> Do you really think that's when he found out or what? Anyway, thank you for your performance. But you know, there's so much, uh, even now today, I find myself so often, I've got to pull myself back because, you know, you just want to get, is that right? Something in man's psyche, we want to be involved. We want to do it ourselves. It can't really be that simple. Is that right? I mean, is that right? Just a little bit more here. And push there and shove there and manipulate there. Is that right or not? Anyway, oh, grace is not a, per a doctrine. It's a person. Grace is not even a doctrine. It's the gospel. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. Romans chapter 1, where he talks about, <clears throat> For I'm not ashamed of the gospel it's of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. I like that. You know, I was thinking about this, and we were talking about it just before we were having a bite to eat there. But, you know, we access grace by faith. You don't pray for it, hello, but you access 
grace through faith. Is that right or not? So who would be better positioned for a move of God than the faith churches? And so often it's the faith churches that seem, well, I don't know, just some anyway, that have seemed to oppose. Anyway, this, this is me. Just a little while ago, you know, God's given me a real love for my own nation, my own people. Years ago, I had stars and stripes in my eyes. We moved to, the, to California. I thought that's where you had to go. And eventually God got my attention. I was totally out of the will of God. You know, it's amazing. And I'm not saying God did this. But when we lived in the territory, I've been charged by a wild buffalo, hit my car, just about rolled it over. I've been charged by a wild uh, a boar. I've walked on the back of a crocodile in the mud, never got a scratch. Moved to the United States out of the will of God. I ended up in hospital with mononucleosis and hepatitis combined. Now, I'm not saying God did that, but it got my attention. Anyway, <laughs> so we, we went home anyway. But you know, it's amazing, just the grace of God. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. Not because I'm smarter or better, but I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. Is that right? You are graced to do what God's called you to do. Amen. I'm not graced to do what Pastor David or Colin, you know, I can't be that or Joseph, anybody else. I'm graced to do what God's called me to do. Right. God's given me a love for my own people. Just my own, somebody has to have a love for their own people. And Jesus wept over his own people. You know, I don't mean it wrong, but so often we're always looking somewhere else to another different country. And I, and I understand that. But somebody has to have love for their own people. Amen. And I'm asking God for a move of God. I mean, how many, oh, how many times have we tried to have it whip something up for a move of God? Yeah, binding, loosing, love's going to come there. Nothing's worked nationally. And so the Spirit of God said to me, well, let me ask you a question. How would you get saved? I said, well, by grace through faith. He said, so it's none of your own work. And I said, no. He said, well, what make you think it'll be any different for your nation? You've given it your best shot. You've tried everything that, that opens and shuts. How about we just do it my way? Just do it my way. There's a novel idea. Is that right? There's a real novel idea. You know, and the more that I'm traveling around, particularly the Aboriginal churches, and that, I, they, they, they just respond to grace like I've never seen. You know, dozens of people, 20, 30 Aboriginals were saved in one time. Uh, we were this young pastor, as I say, and he's saying to me, he says, i got a real problem with this grace message. And I said, well, just stay cool. I said, just stay teachable. I'm not going to ram it down your throat. I said, you know, uh, we'll just be, have an argument. If, you're not, if you don't have a revelation, just leave it alone. We'll just be friends. Let's move on. <laughs> I preached that night and probably a dozen Aboriginals out of maybe 50 people just get saved, come run. Even the bishop, hello is in the service, I think, to keep an eye on me, takes notes, want me to pray for him. I mean, I just, they're just responding the simple message of the gospel of grace. Amen. That night, the young pastor, in the middle of the night, the Spirit of God woke him up and said, Son, you've got more faith in your own faith than you do my grace. And he said, I saw it straight away. I saw it where my, he said, where my heart really was, in my own ability. Is that right or not? We've got our formulas and 25 messages and for, anyway, 32 steps for this and whatever. I feel alive again now. Is that right? You know, but in Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, how many of you believe the Bible? I mean, you really do believe the Word of God. In Galatians, here somewhere, and it was here before, I've got a new Bible and it doesn't open to the right pages yet. But in Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes in verse 6, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So now he equates grace with the gospel. Hello? Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel. What would be a different gospel? You wouldn't have to go far from this building to hear a different gospel. I don't even know your city, but back here where I live, you wouldn't have to go far to hear a different gospel. You've got to wear certain clothes. You can't wear makeup. Hello, is this right or not? You've got to go to church on a certain day. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And away and away we go. Is that right or not? You know, holiness group. Don't tell me that we don't have our own set of laws and rigmarole even in the church. We are in the United States, what, a few months ago, and we're down in the southern states. My wife loves the, those old mansions in the southern United States. Yes, ma'am, no ma'am, three bags, full man. She loves all that stuff down there. And we're in the place, uh, Nacogdoches, where they filmed the movie Still Magnolias. All these old magnificent mansions everywhere. So I'm taking photographs, Jan's stand, standing there dribbling all over the buildings. You know, she loves that. So she strikes up a conversation with this lady. And I've just come back and I catch on the tail end. 
And they find out that she's a Christian. So she looks at my wife and she said, you can't be a Christian. Jen said, why? She said, because you've got slacks on, you've got pants on. So now we're all going to hell because we wear jeans. <laughs> How stupid is that? Is that right? I mean, the holiness group, whether or not you wore makeup, if the bar needs painting, paint it. Is this too deep or what? <laughs> so now, you know, you've got to go to church on Saturday, the seventh day at Venice, or is that right? JWs or Jehovah's, is that right or not? Come knocking at your door, you're not allowed to have a blood transfusion, you've got a watchtower. If you're a Mormon, I mean moron, I mean sorry, whatever it is, you've got, you got to wear special underpants. <laughs> check it out, go check it out for yourself. Don't tell me in Christianity we don't have our own sets of things. So the gospel of grace is not enough. Now it's got to be a few other things that you and I add. When the Israelites come out of Egypt, I mean, this is even before the law. A perfect example of grace. Nobody's sick. Nobody throws their young. Is that right or not? Their clothes don't wear out. Their shoes don't wear out. Pillars of fire by night. Pillars of... This is before, the, is that right? The law even. How all they got to do every day is walk out and pick up manna. That's all they got to do. But how long is it before somebody says, we need something more than this? We need some flesh. How often is it when you preach the gospel of grace, how long is it before somebody says, this is not enough, we need some flesh? We need something more. But with, the, how many of you know, with the quail, same, so came the snakes, the serpents. It's, it doesn't seem to be enough, the gospel. It's always something's got to be added on. I was sharing with pastor, I'm leaving later anyway. I don't know you people, so I'm not trying to offend anybody. <laughs> but you know, I was talking to a bunch, you know, and they'd been into uh, uh, Freemasonry. I said, well, poor old God, poor old God, just creates the universe. You know, he talks about everything is finished, everything of old is gone, it's complete, it's finished, everything is brand new, except if you'd been a Freemason. I feel the love's coming out. So it's not enough, the gospel. Now we've got to go through some special deliverance service if you're a Freemason. I feel the love is coming right over there. Hey, or you go somewhere, it's your cult capital of the nation. Well, I've heard that at least a hundred times. There must be a lot of occult capitals in our country. This is where all the witches are, meeting up on the mountains. Is that right? You've got to go through special deliverance service. I was telling pastor before, my ex-associate, when I, he got saved, the day before he got saved, had a shotgun in his mouth, going to blow his head off. He'd been high up in the, in the Freemasons. He'd been in the occult. Never once has he ever been through a deliverance service. Just began, got a revelation of the grace of God, the Father heart, renewed his mind, I tell you, and now pastors some of the best churches in our nation. Hey, the gospel of grace. I'm very quiet in this Presbyterian church right about now. The gospel of grace. He says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from whom who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Is that right or not? Go over to Galatians chapter 3 with me. Let's read on. See, listen, law. Is that right? What's the law? You doing something for God. What's grace? God doing something for you. Something that you couldn't do yourself. Can I have an amen or what? Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, you foolish Galatians. I think it's a little stronger in some translations. You idiots. <laughs> Who has bewitched you? Bewitched witchcraft that you should obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ, Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law, by your own efforts, or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. Bewitch witchcraft. How many of you know law and faith or law and grace are opposites? Can I have an amen or what? You can't, you can't live in both realms. You know, if you're going to live by, by law, then that's the way you're going to have to go. As for me, I ain't going back there. I, just, I don't care who says what. I don't care what's preached. I'm not going back under law. I made the decision. I am not. I am not going to put myself back under law again. Going to have an amen or what? Amen. You know, spirit and flesh, they're opposite. Look at verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh, by your works? Is that right or not? Is what he's talking about. You know, drop down to verse 10. He says, For as many as, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. 
For it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the Lord to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the, men, the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Is that awesome or what? Is that all right? Hello. Now, I'm going to say some things. Let me just say up front. I wouldn't preach this in any other church. I, don't, I would not even preach it in a church, but I talked to pastor before. But if I was going to church, I wouldn't preach this in a church. I really believe it needs to come from a pastor. But I, it bothered me for a long time, you know, if we're, we're redeemed from the curse. Is this correct or not? Yeah. Either we are or we're not. Yeah. You know, I've heard, heard pastors get up and say, if you don't tithe, you're cursed. And I said, well, hang on. It's got to be one or the other. I, I'm not, I, I, listen to me. I, I tithe because I want to, not because I think I'll be cursed if I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I serve God because I want to, not because I have to. I pray because I want to, not because I have to. And now, hello, I go to church because I want to, not because I have to. But it bothered me for a long time, you know, that we're putting people back under a curse. You're redeemed from the curse, except if you don't tithe, you're cursed with a curse. Now, it's got to be one. Uh, is that right or not? Or is this just me? Hey, I'm not all that smart. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I can work that out. It's either one or the other. Can I have an amen? amen. So here he talks about that. You know, you can't mix grace with law. Right. It's going to neutralize both. We talk about a little bit of balance. No, it will neutralize the whole thing. Is that right? Yes. Talks about, you know, your religious traditions have nullified the word of God. So here, I was just thinking about some of these things. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. You know, and he thinks he keeps the law. Nobody kept the law. He says, Master, what do we have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him, he says, I do all that. I, I, I do that. Well, nobody did. And Jesus says, well, okay, let's look at it this way. You're, and I'm paraphrasing here. Is this okay? What's the first commandment? Have no, no, no God before. Your God's money. Is that right? You take your God, get rid of everything you got, give it to the poor. He didn't tell anybody else that. Don't build a doctrine. That's what he told that rich young ruler. Works. He says, I, I, I can't do that. And away he goes. How about, and a little bit later, he comes across a total crook called Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is a tax collector, an absolute total crook. He says, Zach, I'm coming to your house for lunch today. Oh, will you beauty? Is that right? In the presence of grace and truth, what happens? Zacchaeus gets touched. He says, everything I've ever stolen, I'll, I'll return it. Half of my goods. Is this correct or not? I'll, I'll give to the poor. What does Jesus say? Today, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your house. What do you want to live under? Grace or law? Now, you know, I'm not saying there's nothing we do. The Bible talks, I really, you know, we were talking about James. I love the book of James. But James was written long before Paul wrote his epistles. And can I have an amen or what? And Paul even talks about law, but also uh, about works, I should say, certain things. But notice the emphasis is on grace. Every letter he writes talks about grace. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. You know, we, we start to see, you know, at Mount Zion, how many of you know this, what happens? God wanted to make a nation of priests. Is that right or not? And so he speaks to them. And so what do they do? Self-righteously, they say, all that God has commanded us to do, we're well able to do it. We can do this in our own. Strength. That's what they're saying. We can do this in our own strength. Can I have an amen? amen? Put themselves under the law. The flesh is activated. Next thing, the golden calf shows up and judgment. See, listen to me. Law, is that right or not? Activates the flesh. Can I have an amen or what? I don't know about you, but you know, it activates the flesh. Faith activates grace. Look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 55. It says, death, where's your sting? Hades, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Now, I didn't write it. That's what Paul writes, New Testament. The strength of sin is the law. Only two times, I think I shared last time I was here, but when it's your turn to minister, you can do it your way. I've only ever really had two major, major, major uh, impartations in my life. I, I'm talking about after I got saved. And once in the 1970s, we owned a gun shop, fishing tackle shop in Darwin. I never had the slightest intention of ever being in ministry. I just wasn't interested. 
I thought you were a loser. That's the absolute truth. I thought you were a loser. That's why you went in ministry, because you couldn't really make it in life. That's the absolute truth. <laughs> the ones that I saw, the cruise directors for the next Titanic, hello, or the cheerleaders for the next depression. You know, anyway, I feel the love's coming down. Got your clothes out of a missions barrel, wore those. Uh, anyway, we won't go there. We're... I remember going up to a guy and he had his sandals on. He said, I'm a missionary. I said, I know. Anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> we're not going there. We're not going there. But, you know, that, that's absolute, absolute truth. I just didn't never, I just leave me alone. I served on a board. I was spirit filled, you know, but I just never wanted to be in ministry. And my wife talked me into flying down to Adelaide to hear some black American preacher called Fred Price. Changed my life forever. In one week. I had a revelation of faith all of a sudden. How many of you know when you get a revelation? It's too late to talk you out of it. Don't shake my tree. I'm happy. Leave me in my ignorance. All of a sudden, I could see it. And I said to my wife, well, I'm gonna... it changed my personality. It changed my destiny. I said to Jen, Let, let's set our business. We're going to Bible school. I'd never even remotely thought like that. But six, seven years ago, we were over in Joseph's church in, in Singapore. Now, we've been going there for 25 years. But I'm sitting there in the, in the middle of a meeting and all of a sudden. See, grace sometimes I think is more even caught than it's taught. That's spirit of grace. And it's just touched me. And all of a sudden, you get a revelation. All of a sudden, you just get a revelation of what Jesus Christ actually did for us. Mm. Paid the price. Is that right or not? There's nothing you can do yourself. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Can I have an amen? Right. And a revelation of grace, I started to cry. You know, I was just thinking because before I was saved, you know, I was a boozer. Well, I gave up drinking because guzzling was quicker. I grew up in a real small country town, booze, cars, girls. That's all. That's all. I, you know, I'd never heard the gospel in, before God. I'd never heard the gospel until I was married with kids. One of my friends out of the Navy, you know, was an Anglican priest. Cross hanging around his neck, you could have anchored the Queen Mary to. Turned back. A lot, but I never heard the gospel. I just heard religion. I heard law. I heard the Ten Commandments, never, and it turned me so off, turned me right off Christianity altogether. I don't want anything to do with that. If that's God, I don't want anything to do with it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But, you know, a couple of years ago, I'm looking at this old photograph when I was 17 and playing footy, real football, Aussie rules, not, anyway. <laughs> not like that. But two, two thirds of my friends are dead. And I'm just going through. Died in an alcohol related accident, one guy cut in half. One of my closest friends of this age, two years ago, died in an alcohol rehabilitation hospital. So out of it, didn't know, did not even know his own name. I, I cried. Did, so scrambled his brains, did not even know his own name. One of my friends drove his car into a tree a couple of years ago, wiped himself out. I've known him all my life. I'm looking at all these young ones that have died. And then I look at my lovely wife and my kids and my grandkids. And I think that, for the grace of God, could have been me. Amen. Now, because I'm better... Not because I'm smarter, but when I heard the gospel of grace, I grabbed it. The day, the day I heard the gospel of grace, my wife and I both accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. That's 40 years ago. Never backed it, never ever wanted to, never believed God made you sick. Never believed ever in my life that God put me through testing, trials, temptations. Just the grace of God. So grateful for the goodness of God, the grace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just flapping my gums. You know, just that simple grace, the goodness of God. You know, here and he's talking about, is that right? <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. First Corinthians chapter 15, it says that uh, the, the, the sting of death is sin and the strength of, the, of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that good or not? Yes. Yet we still teach series on the Ten Commandments. Killing each other, other softly. <laughs> little bit by little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit of light. I feel the love's coming out. You know, maybe if you're under bondage, then there's no revelation of grace. That's, I'm not being smart. There's just not that revelation. Unconditional love. You know, it's hard to get your mind around anything that's unconditional. We were back in Darwin a couple of weeks ago. You know, my, my son plays in a blues band on Saturday night. So we go down. We're sitting on the, on the, you know, 33 degrees looking out of the beautiful sunset, scratching with all the sand flies. I love it, you know. Just looking out, and I'm just sitting there, and they're playing, you know, and all of a sudden, this big Harley boom, 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 pulls up alongside of me, rough as guts, bikey. Big tats all up here, you know, pulls his helmet off, and all the, walks up and sat straight in front of me. Hasn't even spoken, I recognize him as a young man that used to be in my church 20 years ago. We haven't even greeted each other. He just looks at me and says, Cole, I still love Jesus. That's the first thing he said to me. 
And he said, I'll tell you something else. He said, I haven't been in a church in 20 years. They wouldn't have me on their finger for a wart. And a tear rolls down his cheeks and he looks at me and he says, but I can tell you this, he never leaves you nor forsakes you. It's called unconditional love. Now, when we were under law, we would have beaten that person up. Dear God, you're backslidden, you're mongrel, you're going to hell for sure. But you know, sometimes I wonder if some of those people have got more revelation of grace than what we do. He said, he said, I still love the Lord. He's just sitting there before we've even said hello. He said, I'll tell you something, Cole. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. Unconditional love. Get your head around unconditional. Unconditional. Everything else is conditional. Is that right? If you do the right thing, if you perform correctly. Is that right? You do the certain things and you... Is that right or not? You know, it's the goodness of God that brings man to repentance. Repentance. There we got another religious idea. I used to think repentance, run out the front, ball, squall, how kick. That could be nothing but emotion. I've ministered a lot in Asia. I can tell you, I've been in Indonesia, watch people come down the front and cry so much that were a pool of tears on the floor, but then they'd just ring the bell ding, and cut it off like that and they'd all go back to their seats. And a few years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, my, my brother-in-law, like we, we coax him along to church. You know, he's hard, real hard, raised in New Guinea, rough, tough bloke. And we coax him a lot. And the guy that's going to preach that night was about as exciting as watching grass grow. <laughs> you might as well read a telephone book. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, dear God. He gets up and goes out and gets saved. No bawling, squalling, howling, rolling. But never has turned his back on Jesus. We're not just talking about behavior modification but genuine heart transformation. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Not just a little touch of the head and feel the goods, but genuine heart. Is that right? Revelation of the heart. The longest journey you will ever take in your life, the longest journey you will ever take is about 20 inches from your head to your heart. I'm not being smart. A lot of us, this is where we live out of here, but it has to get down to your heart. When I, when I minister to people now, you've got to minister to people's heart. Forget their heads. It has to touch their hearts. If it doesn't touch their heart, it won't last. It's just behavior modification. We can make something happen. What would you do? How long before it wears off? Can I have an amen or what? But genuine revelation, heart transformation. In 40 years from Fred Price, I, I, I could preach to you the message right now tonight that Fred Price preached those, those nearly 40 years ago. I could preach it off the top of my head right now. That's how it affected me. I mean to be rude. But there's people here that heard preach, pastor preach last Sunday, don't even know what he said. Well, thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> Not this church, a, 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 another church. Another church, then, right? Sometimes I say, if you don't believe me, okay. And I ask somebody, were you here? Well, give me three points that he shared. <laughs> 40 years. And I could preach that message off the top of my head. That's how much it changed my life. Anybody? You know, just get that revelation of grace. Repent. Metanoia in Greek. Go back and study your Greek. Meta change, noia, mind. That's what the words means. Radically change your mind. Radically change your way. See, you know, Paul says, I don't frustrate the grace of God. He talks about that the grace of God may not be in vain. How could you frustrate the grace of God? How could the grace of God be in vain? Simply because you think you don't need it. I can work this out myself. You got marital problems? I can work this out myself. I've, I've been to all sorts of counseling. I can work this out. Or maybe your, your marriage or your business or your minute, whatever it is, your health. I don't need the grace of God. I can work. No. As smart as you are, as talented as you are, you'll come to a time in your life you realize that you don't have the answers. Is this too deep? Come to the place. Is that right? Metanoia. Radically change. Every time pastor preaches, you get a chance to repent and radically change the way you think. I'm sorry, Jesus, is that right? I realize I need that grace. Grace has to be received. Not everybody receives grace. You know, you watch people, go on, on. Well, you can pick up body language. I'm not stupid. Anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm on that point. Is that right? Go to Romans with me. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 in verse 17. I love this passage. I love, love, love this passage. In verse 17, if, if by one man's offence death reigned through the one, that's talking about Adam, much more. Oh, is that awesome? Or much more. We serve a God of abundance. Surely the God that created the universe would know the breaking limit of fishing nets. But he tells, is that right, Peter, let down your net. And they fill the capacity, they start to break. Surely the God that created the universe would know how much loaves and fish it would take to feed the multitude in the wilderness. 
He only created the universe, but he feeds everybody to their capacity with 12 basketfuls left over. It's always a God of abundance. Much more, much more those that what? Much more those who receive. Little key word, receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ or reign in life as kings. I, I don't mean to be smart. Not everybody receives grace. As I say, you can just pick up, well, that's nice, that's wonderful, but I'm not that weak that I have to have, I can work it out myself. But there'll come a time in your life where you won't be able to work it out yourself. I, I, I don't want to wait till then. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Unmerited favour, undeserved. I love it. I don't, if you don't want it, I'll take your share. Undeserved, unmerited. I love it. I love it. Undeserved. What does Paul say? The great apostle Paul, one of the most brilliant minds. In fact, I've read of the top five minds that has ever lived. He goes to God. Is that about the? Is that right? Ask for the thorn in the flesh to be. Re- to be removed. What does God say? Well, no, you just need my tapes on 32 steps to this and 45th formulas to that. No, he doesn't. He says, you just need a revelation of my grace, Paul. My grace is sufficient. Is that right? That didn't mean no. Whatever you need is. Grace fulfills it. My grace is sufficient. And what does Paul say? From now on, I'll glorify God in my weakness, in my inability to produce the results myself. For when I'm weak in my own estimation, then I'm strong in God. What what does the word say? God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Is that right or not? I mean, it's simple. Really, it's pretty simple. But somewhere along the line, I don't know what it is, whether it's just our flesh, we've got to get involved. Is that right or not? See, if the law break one, you're guilty of it all. And that law activates the flesh. Is that right? Don't preach Ten Commandments. How about we preach the grace of God? The gospel of grace. You know, as I say, been traveling right around. We've just been across Darwin, Catherine, Kananara, Kimberley's not the end. That's not the end of the world, but you can definitely see it from there. <laughs> Broom, I'm in right across the top. You know what I'm finding? People are just hungry for that message of grace. They don't want to be told they're all mongrels going to hell. Just the goodness of God, the grace of God. Oh, you're just giving them a license to sin. They don't need a license to sin. They just do it anyway. That's not real deep. Do you really mean all of our teaching on law has got them to... I don't think so. It's done very little but alienate the church. Anyway, thank you. Anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm. You know, a few years ago when I was pastor in Darwin, I was going through a really tough time. I forget what was happening. And where we used to live, we used to live on the, on the, on the foreshore looking out over the harbour. We're living up on a cliff in the foreshore. Right, I could see crocodiles from my front porch. Anyway, looking across the harbour and the, the storms we have in the tropics, if you've ever been in the tropics, you know the storms, you can just about touch the blackness, the, uh, the, 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 the cyclones. I'm sitting and the storms rolling across the bay, really, really black, lightning. It's hitting the ground when it hits the ground. And we had an elevated house and the house would shake. I'm looking there and it's rolling towards across the bay and every bird is bolting for cover. They're terrified. They're just bolting and, you know, I'm just sitting there looking at this and all of a sudden I just happen to look up and here comes this magnificent seagull flying straight into that storm and hit those three metre wings and he would hit that storm front and it would just catapult him up and would scoot him right up the top and he'd wheel around and you could hear him. He's having the time of his life. Woohoo, you beauty. All the other birds are bolting, running for cover, scared stiff. And he's just harnessing the power of the storm. Just to, He'd lock those wings and the storm would just shoot him straight up. And I'm thinking, that's awesome. I'm just sitting there. And I hear this voice say, that's how you need to live your life, Carl. That's how you need to live your life. Stop fighting. Stop stressing and pushing and shoving and just harness the power of grace, the goodness of God. Just allow Anybody know what I'm talking about? Instead of all of that striving and pushing and shoving, I don't know about you, but even now to this day, sometimes I've got to stop. I'm thinking I'm trying to, I'm driving this thing myself. I'm just pushing this whole thing myself. I remember when I first started in traveling ministry, true story. The senior minister said, (laughs) (coughs) the senior minister, you'd know the name if I mentioned. I'm, I'm trying to find out how you get meetings. He said, you just kick all the doors and go through the doors that open. I thought, well, who gives a heck about being led of the Spirit? Just kick the doors. 
Whatever door opens, just go through. That's works of the flesh. That's just total works of the flesh. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, which is that right or not? You know, if it's not God, I really don't want to be involved anymore. Now, this is just me. I'm not getting cranky. But if it's not God, I just don't want to be. If you want to go for it, go. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't work. I just want to be led of the Spirit. For as many as are led of the Spirit, these are the sons of God. You know, even in our books, this, is that right? The purpose-driven life. I don't want to be driven. The purpose-driven church. I'm not, I just don't want to be driven. Holy Spirit doesn't drive people. He leads people. Leads and guides. It's the devil that drives people. The flesh that drives people. Are you led of the Spirit or simply driven by your flesh? I'm not just asking you. This. The Lord asked me that recently. He said, son, are you really led of the Spirit or are you simply just driven by your flesh? Because somebody else is doing it. Or you think that's what you want to do. Just let your flesh drive you. I don't want to be doing that anymore. I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. I don't want to be doing that anymore. But you know, anyway, thank you, Jesus. You know, that new wineskin, it's soft, it's pliable, flexible. Blessed are the flexible, is that right or not? You know, just some of the things, and we were talking about this before. But it's amazing. It really is amazing. You know, I've probably even preached it myself. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Paul doesn't write that. Paul doesn't write that at all. You know what Paul writes? We forgive because we have already been forgiven. Law or grace? Read it for yourself. Under law, if you don't, is that right? If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Paul writes, we forgive because we have already been forgiven. Whole different concept. I've, is that right? Hello. You know, were you led of the Spirit or simply driven by your flesh? Is that right? No. Well, anyway, I, the more that I look into that and just just changed my life. You know, I hear things regard iniquity in your heart. God won't hear your prayers. Well, that's not what, that's not what grace says. Law. We're going to make ourselves more acceptable to God. Pray more, fast more. And I'm not saying don't do those things. But what's the motivation? What's the reason that you do the things? I go to church because I want to, not because I have to. I fast because I want to, not because I have to. I tithe because I actually want to, not because I have to. Not because I think I'm cursed if I don't. I don't have any problem if I, oh, I missed out. Oh, I'm cursed. No. That, that, that's just, you know, it's just so, how many of you know how free that is? It's so liberating. Is that right? You know, we talk about, you know, confessing all your sins. You couldn't even remember all your sins. Hello, liar, liar, pants on fire. So you missed one out, so you're going to hell. That's what the Muslims think. Is that right? Think about this. You've got to get up and pray five times a day facing Mecca. That's bondage if I've ever heard it. If you're a Buddhist, you've got to keep attaining. Because we studied with Buddhism because we're so turned off Christianity. And you've got to keep attaining another level, another level. That works. It's all based on what you do. It's only the gospel of grace. It's not based on what you've done. It's accepting what he's done. Now, I've, I shared this before, but like I say, there's a lot of new people here. About two years ago, I go to a barber shop on the, on the Gold Coast and the barber's rough as bags. Every second word's a swear word. If you took the swear words out of his vocabulary, he would be struck dumb. I mean, that breaks up, kangaroo split if ruin drops it in the middle. And I'm going, I don't even want to be here, but he's a good barber, so I'm there. And he's away this day and there's a lady barber and she's rougher than he is. Now, don't get all cranky, but tattoos. Now, I didn't grow up that way. What are we going to do one day when we wake up and find out we're not all Maori warriors? But anyway, that'll come to me in a minute. It'll come to you in a minute. So anyway, they're there and, and this lady rough as guts. And she's going for it and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't even want to be here. She looks at me and says, what do you do? I said, I'm a minister of the gospel. So the language changes immediately. Isn't it amazing how the language changes? <laughs> Drops like that. Anyway, it's not the f first time I've heard bad language. I doubt if it'll be the last. But anyway. So then she starts on God. God did this and God did that. And here we go. And I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting a bit angry here. And I said, look, lady, just stop. I said, look at me. Look at me. Look. No, no, I said, look at me. Look. I said, look, because they won't even look at you. I said, look at me. And I said, I'll give you a revelation, lady. I said, God loves you just like you are. And you could have heard a pin drop. I said, I said, it's called unconditional love. I said, God loves you just like you are. She said, you don't even know what I've done. I said, it doesn't matter what you've done. If it's based on what you've done, I don't qualify. I'm, I'm, I'm finished, Jack, because if it's based on what I've done, I, don't, I just don't qualify. I said, it's not based on what you've done. It's accepting. Is that right? Mm. 
the gift of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Those who receive. Can I have an amen? And I looked and she started to cry. Just right there. The barber's all looking at me. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Two weeks later, she turns up at church. Still going to church. Now, if I told her she's a mongrel going to hell, she's probably used to that. But I told her God loves you just like you are. And she didn't know how to handle it. She just didn't know how to handle it. So I go back to the barber about a month later and the barber sees me, breaks through the people and he walks up and he says, oh, I don't know what you did to Helen, but that must be one hell of a church. That's exactly what he said. And I said, well, maybe you need to come too. And he says, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> it so impressed him to change. That's what he said. He just, the first thing he said to me, I don't know what you've done, but that must be one heck of a church. It's the goodness of God amen. that brings man to repentance. Amen. Can I have an Amen. It's just so easy. I'm just loving it now because we were talking about preaching, but it's so easy just to share the gospel with people. Yeah. You're just on a plane or a train. I was trying to get that lady's attention. I thought she was going to die in a plane crash today. <laughs> I mean, she's white knuckle. I was going to say, it's all right, lady. It's okay. The goodness of God, you know, but she wouldn't look at me. <laughs> she, she wouldn't look. She was hanging on for grim death anyway. But it's so easy just to share. Is that right or not? I mean, just the goodness of God. How hard is it to say God loves you just like you are? Right. How is it, lady, God loves you just like you are? Knows everything about your life and it's called unconditional love. Amen. Doesn't it make you want to serve God? Amen. Doesn't it make, it doesn't make me want to go out and sin. And certainly that's the last thing that I want to do. Can I have an amen? Right. I'm just so grateful. The goodness of God, the grace of God, unmerited favour. I love that unmerited, unearned favour. Can I have an amen or what? Hey, go to Romans chapter 9. Let me give you a couple more scriptures here. Romans chapter 9. And look at verse 30 with me. In 9 verse 30 it says here, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. So there's two types of righteousness. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Is that right? If you're going to live by the law, you better keep the law right. and keep the whole law. Right. Or it's the gift of righteousness. Yeah. Make up your mind which you're going to live under. I don't know. But go up to, to, to chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my desire, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they may be saved. For I bear with them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they are being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law. Yeah, now, I didn't write that. That's been there forever. Is that right? Well, for the last couple of thousand years. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The end of the law. I love it. The end of the law. You know, anyway, we can go on. More righteous, you know, more self-righteous we are, the less of Christ. You know, I really believe it's just bringing Jesus back as the focal point of the church. The focal point of the church. He said, if I be lifted up, not if you be lifted up. I'm not being smart, but a lot of the modern church is all about I, me and me. Got eye disease, it's all about me. My eye. I know it's called the iPhone, the iPad. Anyway, we won't go there. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Is that right? He said, if I be lifted up, not if you be lifted up. What did Jesus say? I'll build my church, not your church. Can I have an amen or what? It's really just bringing Jesus back as the focal point of the church. Now, you can do it your way or you can do it God's way. We'll go to John and we'll close off here in the Gospel of John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I love, I love this passage. I've been spending a lot of time... Uh, verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed or manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. In this way, he showed or more correctly, he manifested himself. Then it talks about those that were there. Verse 3, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said, we're going fishing with you. So that doesn't mean they're just going fishing for the day. They've quit. Isn't it amazing when you quit, you go back to what you're familiar with. You go back to the work, the arm of the flesh. That didn't work. So I'll go back to what I'm familiar with. Is that right or not? Can I have an amen? The 22 steps, the 14 formulas, whatever it is, we go back to what worked for us before. And so he's quit. Now, Peter's a fisherman. He knows how to fish. His dad, he's probably his granddad, all been fishermen. Is that right? But they've been out fishing all night and have caught nothing. Look at verse 4. But when morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Disciples did not know that it was, sorry, verse 3. He says, we're going fishing. They went out, they immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. 
Anybody ever been out there? But when morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. His disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said, children, have you any food? And they said, no. And he says, well, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. The word sums in italics. That means it's not in the original manuscript. It was added by the translators. So pull it out. And you'll find, he says, Jesus says, cast your net on the right side and you'll find whatever it is you're looking for. What is it that you're looking for? An answer to your marriage? An answer to your business? An answer to your ministry? I don't know how many people come up and they say, Pastor, can you pray for me? My business, I've been in business 20 years, 30 years, but all of a sudden it's not working anymore. I'm doing the same things, going through the same, what I learned at business college or whatever, but it's not working anymore. Or your marriage or your family or your health, it's not working. All of a sudden you come to the end of yourself. Can I have an amen? And what is Jesus casting it on the right side? You know, with my lightning fast mind, I thought, if there's a right side, there must be a wrong side. Blah, 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 blah. How deep's that? <laughs> but it's not simple as that. Right side, is that right? Always talks about the side of authority, power, and favor. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Can I have an amen? Psalm 16 and 11, I think, says, At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Benjamin, is that right? The one, the son of favor. Benjamin, son of my right hand. When the Jews would anoint their sons always with the right hand. If you're a leper, go back to Leviticus 14 or 16 somewhere. If you're a leper, you came to the high priest, the priest. The priest would slay a lamb, take the blood, and he would dip his right finger into the blood. Right finger into the blood and apply it to the right ear. Read it for yourself. And then he would dip his right finger into the blood and apply it to the right thumb. He would dip it into the blood and apply it to the right toe. What's the significance? Everything you hear from now on will be blessed. Everything that you touch because your thumb is always the thing that touches will be blessed. What's the significance of the toe? Everywhere you walk from now on shall be blessed. If you do it God's way. Now, I was thinking about this right side, right side, right side. You know, just think about that. The right side. Is that right? I don't know. Think about it. You know, there's, there's God's way of doing things. There's our way of doing things. It may not be sin. It may not even be wrong as far as the world, but it's not God's way. If there's a right way, there's a wrong way. Where we live on the Gold Coast, when I first moved to the Gold Coast uh, years ago, we were in a boom. You know, prices were going up. Everybody had jobs. Now, our unemployment rate's twice the national average. We've got a two-tier economy in Australia. Anything to do with mines and minerals is booming. That's pushed the dollar so high that now anything we want to export or people coming into the country is very expensive. It's cheaper to come to New Zealand than go to the Gold Coast for a holiday. It's cheaper to go to Bali, things we want to sell. And all of a sudden now, every second warehouse has a for lease or for sale sign. Our unemployment rate's twice the national average. And I don't know how many hundred of people I'm talking about have come and said, Pastor, can you help me? You know, I've been in business for 20 years. I know how to be. And I'm not in sin. I'm not doing anything wrong. But it's not working anymore. You know, have an amen. Or maybe your marriage or your business or your church or your ministry. I don't know how many people have come and said, Pastor, Pastor, can you help me? You know, I, I've been doing the same thing for 20, 30, 40 years. But it's just not working anymore. Do you have a word for me? I've got a word for you. Cast your net on the right side. Stop trying to do it yourself. Stop trying to put, and I'm not putting down education. That's wonderful. It's not sin, but it may not be God's way. Can I have an amen or what? You and I both know there's God's way. Some of you know the, the Rubens over there, the church we go to on the Gold Coast, Impact Church. They've just opened a $2 million facility. And they don't owe a dollar. Maybe five, six years ago, for those that know Colin's been over to preach there, Five or six years ago, the pastors, they bought five acres of beautiful land. I'll tell you, magnificent land. There we've got resident, uh, I was going to say crocodiles, uh, kangaroos, we've even got koalas and even a couple of snakes. Everything's there. But you know, they didn't, they didn't need, um, they went to the bank for finance and they got uh, something six, seven hundred thousand dollar finance and then they go over to Pastor Joseph Prince's church, they're in the church there and things like that. The Spirit of God speaks to them and says, I don't want you to go that way. Now you can go that way if you want to go, but cast your net on the right side. So they hand the loan back. They haven't even used the loan. They hand it back, cost them five thousand dollars in penalties to hand the loan back. Then they go to their people. No, no 
big noting, no, no putting people under guilt. They just get up and they say, you know, we need $100,000, $200,000. Don't go into debt, whatever. The money would come in. There's maybe 120, maybe 150 people. No millionaires. But two months ago, we opened a brand new building. $2 million. They don't owe a dollar. Not a dollar. Now, I can tell you lots of buildings, lots of churches that have lost their buildings. I don't know one other church in our nation that since the global financial downturn has built a church debt-free like that. And so the pastors of big churches have been coming out saying, Pastor, how did you do this? And he'd say, the grace of God, they say, yeah, yeah, but how'd you really do it? <laughs> in other words, Jesus Pastor said, there's no concept of even what I'm talking about. That just goes over the head. When I talk about grace, I think that's just a f fancy sort of a name, like what you say over your meal. <laughs> I, I, said, I said, Pastor Phil, look, you need to write a book to help other young pastors. He said, what am I going to do? I don't, e say, I don't even know what I did. I don't even know if I, know, know if I could do it again. That's what he said. <laughs> I would just hear the voice of God tell me, I'd do it, and there's the result. They've got granite benches. They've got, if it's carpet, maybe seats, $700. It's painted out complete. The, the grounds are all finished, painted. Everything is complete and finished. They don't owe a dollar. And regularly on Sundays, they get up and say, this is, a, this is just a memorial to the grace of God, mm. the goodness of God, because we couldn't do it ourselves. If they'd taken the loan, they would have been harnessed for the next 25 years. It's paid off in two years. Debt free. Unmerited favour. Undeserved favour. Do you have an answer for me? I do. Cast your net on the right side. Stop trying to do it yourself. It may not be sin. It may not even be wrong as far as the world goes. But it's not the grace of God. It's works. It's performance. Peter's a fisherman. He knows how to catch fish. He's fished all of his life. He goes back to what he's familiar with. The arm of the flesh. Is that right or not? His father was a fisherman. Grandfather, you don't catch fish in the day, don't you catch them at night. You imagine if that's the Aussie vernacular, he'd come up and say, I'm a fisherman, you're a carpenter. You stick to building cupboards and I'll stick to what I know. But he doesn't. Cast your net onto the right side. I'm a fisherman from a long way. You're trying to tell me that the fish are on all one, just one side of the boat? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> I took Kenneth Copeland out fishing in Darwin. Never forget, I took my teenage daughter and she caught all the fish. And he got really ma and mad with her. He said, let me fish on that side of the boat. She said, OK, it won't make any difference. They swapped sides and she still kept, kept catching the fish. <laughs> he said, don't bring your daughter anymore. <laughs> don't tell me the fish are just on one side of the boat. Got nothing to do with the fish. Is that right? It's with this grace or law. Whether you want to do it yourself or the grace of God. I'm just so grateful for the grace of God, the goodness of God. God's unmerited favour. I believe with all my heart. I, I certainly believe with you guys. We're on the, on the verge of another move of God. But I just sense it's coming on on grace. Nobody's going to big note themselves. No names up there. No group, no church, our group. Just the grace of God. I go to one town. It's a, one, this church, the next town, it's an entirely different group. Just open to that moving in the grace of God. So nobody can say, look at me, look at me, it's all about me. The grace, the goodness, unmerited, unearned favour. Father, I just speak blessings over these people. <clears throat> I call them the head and not the tail, I'm above and not beneath. I say, whatever they turn their hands to shall prosper and succeed. The enemy shall no longer put us under curse and bondage, Lord. We are redeemed from the curse. Father, I ask for a revelation of grace, your goodness, your simple message of the gospel of grace. Lord, we just give you the praise and glory. Thank you, Lord. We no longer live under law. We have to perform. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. But we live under grace, God's unmerited favour. And we worship you, the Father. Thank you that Jesus paid the price once and for all. Once and for all. We worship you. We magnify your name.